On this episode of the Ozzy Osbourne Show, New York Times bestselling author Gail Lins opens up about her work with Robert Ludlum, the Hades Factor film, and what it was like to work for a government think tank. It's all up next on the Ozzy Osbourne Show. Welcome back to the Ozzy Osbourne Show. Uh, we are now in episode six. I'm your host, William J. Bruce III, and I'm very excited about our next guest, Gail Lenz. Gail, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Okay, so on your site, there, there's two quotes that I, um, that I got, and I, I just wanted to, to uh, read them to you and then ask you a couple questions. So it says, Gail began her writing career as a reporter where she investigated reporting Oh, where sorry, where her investigative reporting made such an impact uh, that it led to changes in legislation. Um, how? <laughs> well, it was a very interesting situation. This yeah. is when I was working in Phoenix at the Arizona Republic, and they, I was desperately asking for you know something deeper that I could dig into. For sure. And uh, there had been some questions they, uh, the newspaper had received from parents of. Uh, young people, children, and young, and adults who were being cared for at a facility for um, mentally disabled, and uh, they felt that their their kids weren't getting what they needed. So I did a, I believe it was a three part series, and one of the things that I came that I was I was studying all the documentation and talking to people was the amount of money that the state was giving to care for each person okay. was not the amount of money that was being spent on each person. Oh, okay, yeah. It was a very simple thing. Yeah. Uh, the the article, it's the, the three-part series itself, talked about the necessity of, um, of taking care of, of, of handicapped people who are so severely handicapped and uh, uh, the strains on family and, you know, the good things that the state was doing. But the bottom line was... They were not, that many of the questions that were being asked about the care of these people could have been handled if a bit more money had been spent. For sure. Quality of food, for instance, uh, day trips out to, you know, to stimulate their intellectual ability. And so later on, the, um, I don't remember, I think it was another year or so, but the legislature did do some work and adjusted that so that that did not happen again. Okay. It was pretty wonderful, you know, that you yeah. could see the power of, of good work. Yeah. And, the, and it was wonderful to see the state stand up like that. That is. Uh, that's, that's really good. Um, so it said later uh, she was the editor uh, with rare top secret security clearance at a government think tank where assorted shadowy figures passed through. <laughs> um, yeah. First off, I love your use of shadowy figures. Um, what, what is a shadowy figure? And, and, cause like, it, it sounds like so interesting and almost a little, uh, I would be a little worried. Oh, well, the reason that I actually went to work there, I think will, um, amuse you too. And that's because, uh, I was in school at the University of Iowa, uh, when, uh, the author of Cat's Cradle, I, I don't, um, uh, now I'm blanking on on who wrote Cat's Cradle, okay. was there at teaching. And uh, he uh, talked, this was a classic at that point, and he was talking about uh, how he, I asked him, how did you come to, this terrific, is Kurt Vonnegut. I asked Kurt, well, where did you come up with this phenomenal idea? Because it was based on the Midas myth, in right. which King Midas, of course, touched anything and it turned to gold. Okay. But in this story, anything that was touched turned to ice. Hmm. And the ramifications of that, the craziness of it, and of course the you know the tragedy of it, was really something. He handled it so beautifully. And he told me that he had gone to work one summer when he was desperate for money, uh, which most of us authors are when we first start out particularly, right. at a think tank. And the, he said the ideas were bouncing off the wall, and that's where he came up with that idea. So I decided, well, gosh, if it worked for Kurt, it might work for me too. <laughs> so 
<laughs> I went to work for a think tank in Santa Barbara, California, okay. that was owned by General Electric, and General Electric did a lot of military uh, work. And really? we had contracts with various other organizations, including government organizations. So that's why I had to have clearance to work on all of these documents, these projects. And what I discovered there was not only the ideas were bouncing off the walls, the people were too. It was a fascinating experience. Yeah. Uh, there was such silliness. And at the same time, we would be doing very serious work with hardware and software. The shadowy people who would come through would be nameless. Okay. Every time we went into another room, uh, we had to tap in our code on a keypad. I literally could not walk from my office into the printing room. I had to stop and tap in my code before I could even go in where the printing presses were. So, and if I wanted to go upstairs to another floor, I had to tap in my code. Really? Uh, at that point, we were doing work with DARPA, which is now ERPA, okay. and they were hyper secure. It was, uh, and sometimes I would be introduced to people only by their first names. I would never know exactly what their job was, whether they, because there were enough people working in the building, I couldn't know everyone, whether okay. they were someone who actually worked there or someone who had been brought in. And in those days, we did have a water cooler, and people would st stand around the water cooler and uh, speculate. Okay. And I would hear rumors. Some of them turned out to be true later on, and some of them did not. So it was a wonderful atmosphere. For sure. To uh, to in, um, to uh, get one's imagination going. Yeah. <laughs> also, what's paranoia? You know. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so, how much do you pull from that experience with with, with your writing? I pull that atmosphere a lot. Yeah. Uh, that sense of uh, secrecy. And it's a necessary secrecy. Literally, in the, uh, the security rooms, there were posters from World War II hanging on the wall that said, uh, loose lips sink ships. And <laughs> we'd laugh about it because they were so old, but the message is the same. And that's one of the reason they had it up there was to remind us all that what we were working on, we would not always know whether it would be beneficial to, uh, someone from an enemy country or not. For sure. It, so I'm, I, you, you have this sense of alertness that I think um, I'm always aware of in my books, the sense of secrecy, the necessity of secrecy. How do you break secrecy down? And what is the result of secrecy, of course, is power. And so I write a great deal about power, which I, is what one of the reasons I was drawn to writing esp international espionage, because I became, through my job there, very aware of what was going on in the world okay. and uh, the chess game of country versus country and sometimes over the smallest point but it was a part of uh, of the, the the chess game of you know let's see who can get the most markers it was it's crazy it's a crazy way to live yeah. but that's the way the world is wow um how did you discover your love for writing I was, um, I grew up a very lonely child, and my sister died when she was quite young. Uh, she was younger than me, and it, that just made me even more insular. I grew up in a little town in Iowa, and I found that the world of books um, gave me a window uh, on a new, another way of, t another way to live, other, many other ways to live. There's a wonderful, uh, quotation that goes something like this, um, a book is more than words, uh, it's more than paper and glue, it's the, the uh, open door to another way to live. And so I educated myself largely through books, through mostly fiction, and then I read a lot of nonfiction. Okay. I even taught myself grammar. Really? Uh, I can't tell you why. Yes, but I love the way a sentence looked on the page. Hmm. I love the choice of where to make that paragraph. I loved punctuation. And it was like my brain sort of just went to that. So um, I kind of drove my, my English teachers nuts in elementary school because they're trying to teach all this stuff. And I already know it. And, of course, I did have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but that's how, but that's how my love began, and I wanted to give other people the same uh, experience that 
I had meant so much to me. Now, when you were reading as a child, did you grow up reading spy thriller type stuff? Or what What was it that drew you to that, that genre? I actually, I would have, I kept asking people to recommend books to me. But again, I was in a little town, and even the librarian didn't really guide me. My mother had to go in to get permission, sign a slip of paper so that when I, I was about 10 years old, but I was reading in the adult section okay. uh, to assure them that, that uh, <laughs> mother would pay for any books I lost or destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> never, never realizing that they were so precious to me that that was not going to happen. So uh, I read everything. I would literally start on one end of a library shelf and just work my way across. Oh, wow. It was completely un... Um, without any kind of rhyme or reason. I just read everything I could get my hands on. Wow. And the bizarre thing was I usually couldn't remember the title. I usually couldn't remember the author's name. But I could tell you details from the book, which, you know, when I grew up and began to understand the way our brains work, then, yeah, of course, that's that's what I was interested in was, this, was the story. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I have a granddaughter who reads like that. Really? And, I, and yes, and she was when she was seven or eight, she read all the Harry Potter books all by herself. And, wow. and she's writing now. And I, she, she and I were just on the phone, and she's talking to me about the um, the hero myth, and she okay. understands it. She's telling me about the hero myth, and she's she's nine. Okay. <laughs> Um, There's just that poor child may be doomed to be a writer. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> poor thing. <laughs> poor thing. <laughs> um, for for those who are not familiar with the hero myth, um, can you break that down? Well, it's uh, it's basically uh, the, uh, the the what uh, the obstacles that are thrown in front of a person, a character, a main character. Okay. They usually start out as. Um, somewhat insignificant with rather ordinary lives. And then there are usually three obstacles that they have to um, get past. It's almost like the Oedipus or Ulysses stories. And there's usually one person in the story who is older and wise, who passes on wisdom. And at the end of the story, then the hero has hero or heroine has pulled himself or herself up by their bootstraps and discovered strengths in themselves that they had not realized, and they are transformed. That's cool. Um, going back to how both you and your granddaughter would read like uh, all these books, do you, because I know you, and we'll get into this a little later about, about um, Thriller Fest, um, but do you come across authors who, who don't do as much reading, but still write. Like, it is is what's the relation with the amount of reading versus people who write? I don't know if that's a. No, it's a wonderful question because okay. it's a complex question. Yeah. There are people, and I have met them who did not read as children, okay. and a lot of times it's because they have reading disabilities or they did not have access to books, okay. but they had something else that is. In its way, almost more important. Okay. They had ex- they had exposure in one way or another to storytelling, whether okay. it's you know, their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles sitting on the front porch and telling stories. In my case, it was my mother and my grandmother and the lady, neighbor ladies who would come to coffee in the afternoon, and they would do what they called gossiping. Right. But really, what they were doing was telling stories. Right. There's a, storytelling is is part of our 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 species. Right. Uh, when we come down, when we go shopping, and then we we go home and we tell our spouse or or our neighbor what we saw downtown, we're telling a story. So even though people may not read as children, they can grow up to be fine writers. But then I have the other problem that I have seen happen over and over again, and that is people who come to writing not really because they have a love of storytelling or they have a love of books, but there is something else that, that they're trying to fulfill. Sometimes it's a, um, an act of, 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 being, of, wa- of wanting to imitate. 
Okay. And imitation is really important when you first start working as a writer okay. because that's a wonderful way to learn to write. It's what painters do. Great painters, they sit and copy the masters and, and they teach themselves technique. Um, they teach themselves color balance. They teach themselves a lot of stuff just as writers do when when we study someone else's work. So uh, there's no, to me, one answer, but I, my, I, the one thing that I think is the most important quality that a writer brings okay. to becoming a writer is awe, okay. respect, that, that, a sense of humility. Yeah. Because w- those of us who have that, we're never satisfied. We always want to grow. We always want to make a contribution. We always want to make the next book better. Yeah. And I think that's truly important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how do you, how do you combat writer's block? Uh, I'm not very good at that. I, for one thing, I I don't think there's a very good definition of writer's block out there. Some people, some of us, and I, that includes me, we don't, we can't write because the book is fighting back, because there's something wrong, and we haven't figured out what it is yet. Now, is that writer's block, or is that a normal writer's brain and imagination working, working through a situation? Some books are easier to write than others. Some books just flow out of you, and you can't imagine you'll ever have writer's block again. And then other books are are more difficult. They're more challenging. So it's start and stop, start and stop. It makes you crazy, and then you bang your head against the wall, and you say, why did I ever think I was a writer? Wow. So that's my answer to writer's block. We all have it. A lot of people deny that it exists. They're lying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Um, now, with regards to character development, because I, I I listened to a few interviews that that you did, and you had talked about, um, like for instance, uh, you had talked about creating a, a good villain and having them have a good side. Um, if you're creating a a, a hero, um, could could you talk about how you would create a good her- uh, hero? Uh, I'm I know that there are writers who literally sit down and write a biography of their main characters, including their hero or their heroine. Uh, some writers uh, get out an astrological chart, or do, or do an astrological chart on them. Um, uh, I'm not one of those. Uh, I can't always tell you where characters come from for me, but I, some, I often will just start writing and see what comes, because usually when I create the character, I already kind of know that, a bit about the story. And my whole theory of story, plot, and character is if you can't imagine that hero in any other story, then the story that, that you, if the reader can rather, then the story that you're fighting the character in may not be the right match for that character. On the other hand, if the story is such that you can't imagine any other character leading it, then you probably you've got a you know you've got that right natural match between story plot and character. They have to be indivisible. They have to work together so much that you just can't imagine anybody else playing that same role. So what I do is I trust my unconscious. Once I have that idea for the story, for instance, The Assassins, which is my latest book, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do in that is uh, I'd always written about spies of one kind or another, and I realized no one's really addressed assassins, not really. We we make super assassins, and we write about them and pretend we're writing about assassins, but that's not the same thing. And we say, oh, well, assassins are, oh, they're, you know, they're all psychotic, or they're social, sociopaths, or whatever. And it's not true. They are not all that way. There is a spectrum. So that's one of the things I wanted to do with this book, was create six assassins who are at the end of their careers, highly skilled, masters, really, and uh, play them off against each other so we could see these sort of titans of their field uh, for who they are, what they have grown into, where they came from. But I had to tie it together with another kind of character, uh, a hero, if you will, and a heroine. So when I said about, I brought the hero and heroine from the previous book, 
because I knew they would work well, but creating those six assassins, all different, was a marvelous challenge. I had so much fun. Mm. Uh, and so I, what I did with them was I chose six different parts of the world or countries. I chose different backgrounds. One's former Mossad. Uh, one is former KGB. One's former Islamic Jihad and so forth. That helped me to see their characters. And then I would just start writing. I just okay. needed a little bit. And when I started writing, my unconscious started to deliver ideas. A lot of them worked. Some of them didn't. But, you know, I've been doing this for a while, and I I could catch on pretty quickly when something isn't working. I hope that helps. It's it's such it, it's such an individual um, thing, the way we create. Yeah. But this is, this is basically the way it works for me. Um, now, you had talked about, like, your... your your six assassins and how you'd made them uh, having very distinct, you know, from where they, they're from. Um, have you ever had times where, you know, where it's not so distinct, where characters can end up blending together? Do you ever run into that? No, I sometimes, I used to have characters I didn't need. Okay. Here. Okay. And so that, that's what would happen with that. Uh, so it, it would often take me writing the entire book for me to realize that I was going off into a tangent with those characters just because I was interested in them, but they were adding nothing to the story. And that's not fair to the reader. The reader wants a story where everything counts. So if you've got a character going off into left field, it doesn't count. Yeah. So I would have to go back and, and usually just delete entire uh, subplots. Wow. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah, that helps. Uh, how much research is uh, obviously with with your your background? And I watched an interview. And you talked about how you, you put a lot of research in, into your your stories. Um, how much do you put into a book? And um, do you ever find that the research itself can can slow the momentum of the writing or distract from the writing? There are two kinds of readers. I'm mean, writers. Sorry, those of us who love to research, and those of us who hate to research. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, and you of course hit the nail on the head, William. The uh, those of us who love to research, we can a get so deep into it that we don't write the book, or b uh, start getting discouraged because we have so much yet to do. Because of the, the I, I think. One way to gauge it is the reader wants to trust the book. They, the reader wants to trust the author who's writing this, the book that they're reading. They do not want to have factual errors that they can see. They do not want to have lapses in logic. Because as soon as that happens, they don't want to read the book. They don't trust the author anymore. Right. So it becomes inc incredibly important that the author know enough that they are something of an expert at the moment that they're writing the book. And that's kind of what happens to me and, uh, and my friends who write highly researched books. And then usually what happens is the research falls out of your head. And you can't remember any of it. It drives me crazy because, you know, if I'm interviewed about a book I wrote a few years ago and somebody asks me a very pointed question, I know I knew the answer then. But the life of me, I can't think of it now. It's kind of <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> um, this is sort of a different uh, question. What's what sort of opposition, if any, have you encountered as a female writer? Well, it's not being a female writer. It's being a writer and female writer in my field. Right. Because there are fields that are female, women dominated. For instance, the romance field is. <laughs> and, the, true, yeah. and cozy mysteries are, are dominated by female writers. So there's nothing unusual for a woman. There's a, it's unusual for a man to be writing them. And often men in the romance field will take a female pseudonym to get around it. Right. And I never did want to do that. Um, I my first book was bought in came out in ninety six, which was the the you know, the depth of the nineties when uh the New York Times had withdrawn their spies and thrillers review column, which they'd had for years and years and years, but people were not reading international thrillers. Both uh Frederick Forsyth and Jean Le Carré declared the field dead. It was the end of the Cold War, and the United States was exhausted. And we didn't, I, I had a lot of uh, international photojournalist friends who couldn't get a gig. And we were just, we, we'd shut down. We were tired. And so here I'm coming out 
<laughs> not only not only with a spy thriller, but I'm female. Right. And uh, you probably heard the story that when my agent sent it out to uh, the head of one of the major houses in New York uh, as an exclusive uh, and asked her to get back uh, with a uh, an offer or a, a regret, uh, the... Um, her assistant called my agent and said she loves the book. She'll be making an offer tomorrow morning, but wow. she's ill today. So the next morning, my agent very happily answered the phone, and uh, this uh, publisher said, I love this book, but I can't publish it. No woman could have written it. Oh, and, Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was... The, I was stunned yeah. because I really thought that sort of thing was behind us. Yeah. But apparently not. And, uh, so my, and this was a woman, of course. So my oh. agent turned around and sold it to the president of Doubleday, who was a man. Never questioned whether a woman could have written it. But oh. it, it's the kind of thing that you can't see. This, I mean, sexism, you can't really see it. Yeah. You can, you can feel the results of it. For sure. I know that I have been impacted all along, but, but you know, it doesn't stop me from writing the books. Um, I love the field. I have a lot of friends in it. I think I'm generally considered the woman who broke the glass ceiling in the field. Before yeah. me, it was Helen McGinnis, but she passed away in the 80s. So I figured, well, Helen, you know, I was, what, 10, 12 years later, I figured, well, you know, not that much time had passed. Right. She was bigger uh, than, than Ludlam, uh, bigger than La Carre, bigger than Forsyth, bigger than Ken Follett. She was bigger than all of them. Wow. And there was never that question. But things had changed dramatically by the time I came along. Wow. Now, when Masquerade uh, had come out, um, you had touched briefly in an interview about how Publishers Weekly um, didn't give you a favorable review. Um, how, how, did that, like, how did that affect you at the time? I was crushed. Yeah. And um, there were small mistakes in the review, uh, and my both my 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 domestic agent and my international agent thought it was a great review, but I I had expected to actually be treated with re a little more respect, and um, uh, it was uh, they said something to the effect that I was aping my betters or something like that, and. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the book went on to Publishers Weekly later, yep. named it one of the top ten uh, spy thrillers of all time. So it's like, <laughs> go figure. And yeah, then it went exactly. on to, you know, become a New York Times. But, you know, it's one of the nicest things about publishing as long as that as I have is that bad reviews still hurt. Yeah. But at the same time, it's just one review. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I can remember, um, we were, you and I were talking earlier, my previous husband who passed away in 2005 yes. was Dennis Lins. And one of his pseudonyms, the one that he's probably best known by is Michael Collins. Uh, Anthony Boucher, who was the mystery reviewer for the New York Times, gave uh, his first book, Act of Fear, apparently a scathing review. And then it went on to win the Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's just you just uh it's life yeah so much of life is subjective yeah not everybody's going to agree oh wow. and by the way back to that issue of sexism yeah uh there were uh, so, uh something happened recently and i began to wonder how many women are actually writing in the international uh espionage field and traditionally published, and uh, there are now, uh, I, I could only find seven others, oh, and really? we formed a group called RogueWomenWriters.com, okay. and we have, uh, we just this past spring, we, we started blogging regularly, we have a regular blog, and it, it covers all kinds of things like politics and weapons and, you know, holidays and, and how we write and writing tips and so forth, so anybody who is a listener and interested in in this field, uh, we're, that's a, I'm very proud to be a member of this group, RogueWomenWriters.com. That's cool. That's cool that it that it's also grown. You know. Um, but the problem is, there are only eight of us. 
how many men are writing in the field? Yeah, yeah, it's you know, true too. A couple hundred. Yeah. It's, that's, uh, but it's partly because uh, a lot of editors do not believe that. Well, no, I shouldn't say a lot. I've heard from sources that some editors do not believe that women can write well in the field, so they won't even buy the books. So mm. if the books can't be bought, how can they get to readers? Yeah. Um. So with uh with Robert Ludlum, um, uh, how did working with him come about? I was being called, this is early in my career, I was being yeah. called the female Robert Ludlum. They didn't know what to do with me, obviously, so they called me the female <laughs> yeah. Robert Ludlum, which was, a, you know, I, I, I was, you know, I, I, he's a, he was an icon, and I particularly loved his first six novels. Okay. And he jumped houses, he left Berkeley to go over to St. Martin's, and uh, wanted to not only continue doing his standalone books, but he wanted to start a series. And this would be the first series that he would do on purpose because the Bourne series happened by accident. And uh, so they came to me because of my reputation. And they promised me the sun, the moon, and the stars. I'd get to work with Bob. We'd uh, promote together. And, of course, that opportunity to work with an icon like that, I, right. you know, I couldn't turn it down. Yeah. Even though I was making more money on my own books than I, would, than I did on his. But I, um, the problem was they didn't tell me that he was deathly ill. Oh. So I never actually got to work with him. Really? Uh, of course, I didn't. I never even spoke to him on the phone. Uh, we, uh, uh, anyway, it was, it was a very sad thing for me, but I, I, I had loved his books. I re respected his book, books. Yeah. And, um, so I wanted to continue because I thought I could do a good job to his, and honor his memory. Yeah. And so the, um, the, we, the whole thing started. He had like a, I don't know, a half page idea for a TV series that was never bought, okay. and that's what they gave gave us for uh, the Covert One series to start it. It didn't work uh, because he had the wrong job for the hero, and it was there was a lot of problems with it, yeah. but he gave us a name, John Smith, who became the hero, and and it was enough that, that they could then say that he had created it. Uh, but, but but of course that's uh -huh. not the way it worked. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it, it was the thing that was this was very early in the um, in this whole uh, panoply of well known authors publishing series written by other authors, lesser known authors, and so there was there was resentment that he would do such a thing, particularly when he died. He died around the time that the first book came out. And I was blamed uh, for uh, usurping his reputation, destroying his memory. Oh, it was wow. incredible. I had some people show up at signing for my books, and uh, it was it was very awkward. And the only thing I can say is this was something that Bob wanted. I didn't initiate it. Yeah. He wanted it. His people came to my people. Yeah. Uh, I had nothing but respect for his work. I would not have done it if he had not wanted it done. Yeah, but but now this is all very different. Now I think there's a lot of respect for these um, these new series that people like Clive Cussler um, and um, uh, uh, Jim Rollins have started because they're high quality. Yeah. They're hands on Jim Patterson. I mean, my gosh, what's wrong with having another good book? Yeah. Wow. Um, so you said you didn't even get a chance to speak to him on the phone? No. Wow. He was very, 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 very ill. Wow. He had congestive heart failure. Wow. That, that, yeah. It was kind of a blow, yeah. Yeah. It, I had I had other questions, like, sort of related to that, and so it's sort of, oh, okay, let's skip over those ones. Um, well, he did, you know, when, when we... When the manuscript was finished, it was sent to him. Okay. He was still alive. Okay. And he came and he looked at it and there were, you know, there was a, a note here and there. Um, but it was, you know, he apparently liked the book a lot because there was just nothing there that I would consider no major changes at all. Okay. Uh, he wanted to cut down description on some of the weapons, which was fine. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. 
Now, what was it like when um, the Hades Factor was was turned into film? How was that process? Well, I was again. I had they, nobody told me about it. Okay. I had to find out from my 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 book editor told me about it, that it was coming out. Okay. Uh, no one had uh, no one had the courtesy. Wow. To tell me. And I asked if I could go down to the set because I was living in Santa Barbara at that time. Yeah. And my agent told me, no, I could not go. Wow. Wow. Sorry, I got to get thrown off by some of the... Uh, yeah, it's kind of unexpected. You would not expect that sort of rudeness. Yeah. Uh, I certainly did not. I thought I had written a good book. Yeah, and very a lot of people seem to think it's actually the best book in the series, and it's been, you know, a lot of other writers have come in. Yeah, uh, Jamie uh, Bravelletti is doing them now, and I think she's doing a superb job. Okay. Um. Now with uh, with David Morrell, um, how did you get in contact with him? David and I met originally at the birthday party. Uh, we had the same agent at the time. And I think it was Henry's 65th birthday party, maybe, or 60th, 60th or 65th. Okay. And we met there first, and then I think we met again at the L.A. Times Book Festival. And then we met a third time uh, at the Poison Pen in Scottsdale. Uh, Barbara Peters, uh, who is the incredible ed uh, owner of the bookstore was putting on a one day um how to write a thriller okay. uh, conference and there were a number of us there uh, Kathy Reichs was there and Vince Flynn Clive Cussler was the main speaker okay Lee Child can't rem and and some other my, my editor Keith Kayla several people were there and we kept looking at each other saying, well, we were so surprised because she only advertised it like two weeks before and it, and she had, uh, she filled up instantly with like 200 people and a lot of people were not attending to learn to write. They were attending because we were there right. and they wanted to get their, their books signed. So that told us that there were people, readers out there who were interested in thrillers, not just buying them, but actually talking to us. And so, uh, out of that, uh, I was approached, I can't remember exactly what the series of events was, but I remember saying to Barbara, I can't do this. I don't have time. I'm writing books. And she, then she said, well, pull in David, David Morrell. So when I got home, I called David and I said, well, what do you think? I said, I can't do this alone. And he said, I can't do this alone. So that's how it began. Uh, we started, uh, um, I teach what became International Thriller Writers Inc. And, uh, it was, it snowballed. We knew that there was a hunger out there for collegiality among us because thriller writers tend not to be as, um, uh, um, socially active as mystery writers. Okay. I have no idea why that is, but yeah. that's just sort of the way we tend to be. So it would be an opportunity we'd like to get together once a year. Yeah. And talk and, you know, rub, lift a glass of wine or, or a mug of beer or something. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, when we got together the first time, which was in Toronto in 2004, yeah. they, uh, the fall of 2004, uh, there were about 34 of us who showed up and they, they, the two things they wanted was they wanted an annual conference and they wanted thriller awards because thriller, thrillers were not getting Notice they were not getting nominated. Really? So, uh, that's how the whole thing started. So David and I started it and they voted us co-presidents. And we, within a month, we had bylaws, we had a website, and we were sending out solicitations inviting people to join. And, uh, we had a conference in a year and a half. And we were told over and over again, you know, you're looking at a long, uh, period. This will take, uh, putting on a conference takes three years. Well, yeah. we did it in a year and a half. I mean, we just, wow. it was, the energy was there. Yeah. And it was all volunteer. Uh, David and I out of our own pockets and, um, uh, paid for a lot of the things event and eventually. It was, it was exciting, William. Yeah. It was truly exciting. Do you know when you, when there's something in the air and the time is right, it's like a, a, a snowball rolling downhill collecting more beautiful glistening snow. 
we it was incredible how fast that thing grew. And now I believe it's around four thousand members worldwide. Wow. wow! And we don't even charge dues for the professionals. Those of us who who meet professional standards that based on who publishes us. Uh, and so it's really a thrill to go to Thriller Fest every July in New York City because we get to see not only each other, but we get to meet a lot of readers and uh, and our fellows from other countries. Oh. That leads me to another question um, because I see you have your, your time is, is – because like, I've noticed – um, when I was researching you, you've done like a, a lot of interviews, you know, and podcasts and stuff like, like what I'm doing with you right now. And then of course you're doing international thriller, um, writers and thriller fest and your writing. My question is, how do you divide your time? I'm not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I were better at it. Uh, I I think I what what I what I do is I think of myself as writing all the time, and okay. then life interrupts the writing. For instance, this wonderful conversation I'm having with you is simply an interruption of my writing life. I have a friend who writes pretty religiously from about eight a.m. until noon or one okay. p.m. Yeah. and then that's it. And she does, she accomplishes a, a great deal. I'm not that fast. I'm slower. So I require a longer time. So the interruptions, like as this one is, uh, is, is a, a welcome interruption because it gives my brain a rest. Okay. Yeah. Um, now with your, your husband, um, I had read that you had met on Facebook. Um, yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> I know. It's so embarrassing. Oh, Lord. Well, this was back in 2010 when uh, my novel, The Last Spy Master, came out and my was, was coming out. And my publisher asked me to increase my social media presence. Yeah. At that point, I think I had 1,500 friends on Facebook, which I considered a lot. Yeah. But no, they wanted more. So uh, it was just a friend page. It wasn't an author page. So there was a thing where you could go down this list of people with whom you apparently had a mutual friend. Right. And you could check the box, and the box would send a request to that person to be my friend. So I'm just going down that list. I'm just I'm not even looking at the names because this is horrifying me. Because of course it's uh, it's not about friendship. It's a, yeah. it is about making contact with people who may be interested in reading my books and with whom I hope I can establish some kind of a relationship. Yeah. So I'm going down. I'm checking all these little boxes, and and the emails are or the Facebook mails are going out saying, "Please be my friend. Please be my friend. Please be my friend." <laughs> Pretty soon I get this email from some guy in Maine, and mind you, I am in Southern California, saying, "Do do uh, do I know you? Have we ever met?" <laughs> Golly, and of course I was horrified because this was not a friendship. This is. So a Facebook friendship, which yeah. is a different thing. And I was embarrassed. And so I emailed him back and I apologized and I explained about my publisher. And then I said something to the effect of, you know, I don't, I, I probably won't post off a post off. If you want to be, be my friend, that would be great, but realize that I won't post off it. So I won't be bothering you much. And then after a while, I get a uh, Facebook message back that says, Holy shit. <laughs> uh, you're the real deal. I hope I can say that. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, I debated that. Uh, you're the real deal. And apparently he'd gone and looked me up and yeah. he was living in the, um, in the country uh, yeah. outside Portland, Maine. And he said, uh, you know, my nearest neighbors are deer hunters and they don't talk about books. Please, please bother me. <laughs> wow. It was very, he was very, very funny. And what, and so, while I'm reading this, pretty soon a comment appears after John's, this is John's message, and the, the comment says, uh, John Sheldon is a great writer, I'll publish anything he writes. Wow. Well, my goodness, uh, you know, there are uh, there are un unfortunate people on Facebook and other social media who are kind of nervous-making and probably they could be dangerous and so forth, so you have to be yeah, careful. Yeah, for sure. 
And uh, he told me, this man didn't sound like he was nuts. You know, I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I realized, I, then I go look him up. And, right. and I see he's a retired judge and, you know, all this other stuff about it. And uh, at the same time, I realized that he and I had been posting where all eight of his friends and all 1,500 of my friends could read our posts. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, that was embarrassing. But that I really didn't understand Facebook then, and obviously he didn't either. Yeah. So uh, we switched over to email, and uh, we began a correspondence, which I thought was going to be safe. Yeah. Because he, uh, he was divorced, but I was widowed, yeah. and we were living on either side of the continent, and surely I could just enjoy this very funny, very smart man, and nothing would come of it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and well, a year and a half later, we're married. We're living in Maine. I've moved from Southern California, and we're living in Maine. So it was a wonderful uh, moment of very good luck, and I'm grateful every day for John. Oh, that's a that's a nice story. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, with him being like a, a judge, and uh, I guess he's now more of a prosecuting attorney. Is that right? No, he's uh, he he does he does represent some clients. Okay. He uh, is, he was just basically doing mediations for quite a while and, and scholarly uh, articles, and he would do research for um, attorneys or law firms occasionally. You know, it's nice to keep your hand in. But then yeah. he started getting cases, so he had to buy malpractice insurance again. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 he's he's semi. He's semi practicing law again, but he at the same time, uh, you know, he and I have collaborated on some mystery short stories. He's got, he's working, he's finished his uh, short story of his own that's really good, uh, and he's now working on uh, a children's book that I think a lot of. So he he's done, he does so many different things. I'm very limited. I write books. But he's uh he's inspirational to me. He can he ba- he has a lot of different hats and he wears them all elegantly. Now, do you um, b- being that he has that that background, um, I'm, I'm assuming you you go to him at times for like ideas for maybe to for the courtroom or something like that, uh, or maybe you don't do courtroom things, but uh, something related to that. Do you sort of pull ideas from him at all, or? We do a lot of brainstorming together. Yeah. And yes, you are correct. I don't do courtroom scenes because I'm writing international espionage. Yeah. The uh, but he he's I he 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 brings me his stuff and reads it to me. I even I even read his uh, scholarly articles that are published in bar reviews and so forth because he writes so well that I can actually understand them. So and I'm. I often will give him chapters or read him chapters or just read him a paragraph that I'm having problems with. It's wonderful to be able... I had no idea that I, that this would be part of our relationship. I didn't ever expect to have that again, which is what I had with Dennis. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really so blessed that I have somebody who... He didn't understand what a good story sense he has. He didn't understand what a good writer he is. Uh, he, if he had started very young, he could have had an entire career as wow. a novelist. But, you know, he was attracted to, you know, we do what we do, don't we? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and uh, he, he had a, a, a long and honorable career in the law. So yeah. uh, now this is a second career for him. That's cool. It is cool, yeah. Um. So where can readers find you online? At my website, please visit my website. It's www.gaylins.com, and Gail is spelled G-A-Y-L-E, and Lins is L-Y-N-D-S. Doesn't doesn't matter whether you uppercase or lowercase, but it's, it's gaylins.com. Cool. And do you have any projects that are are coming up soon, or anything like that that you want to give a plug to? Uh, no, I'm working on a new novel right now. Okay. Uh, I hope to have it finished uh, within six months. Okay. And my uh, John and I have a uh, an, um, a piece in a forthcoming book called Anatomy of Innocence, okay. which is uh, a series of articles published with written by people like Lee Child, 
and uh, Sarah Paretsky, uh, sort of a who's who, who, uh, and, and it's all about um, people who have been uh, convicted and sent to prison who were innocent, and how their convictions are overturned. Really? And what their lives become like afterwards. Because nobody's really addressed it in a book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a very interesting book. And then David Morrell and I have a, a short story, a collaboration. It's, David's never collaborated on a short story, so this is kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he realized he could do it, because he's such a, you know, he, he's, he writes alone. But no, he and I collaborated on a short story called Rambo on Their Minds. Okay. And it's, coming out in an anthology uh, called uh, Match Matchup. Yeah, Matchup. Uh, published, uh, it'll be bringing, coming out in June. Wow. And there are big, big, there are some heavy hitters in that too. Lee again, uh, a whole bunch of uh, thriller writers. It's, it's a really great collection. Yeah. Gail, I, I just want to say it has been an absolute honor to have you on on the show and it's just a joy to talk to you so um it's the the thank end of you that's very kind of you oh you're, you're welcome i enjoyed this these questions you really did a marvelous job researching me oh really thank you hey guys thank you for tuning into the ozzy osbourne radio show for more episodes you can check out ozzy osbourne.com that's a-u-s-s-i-e osbourne.com god bless you